Britt mentioned, we are going through a series that we've entitled Walking with Kings. We're going to look at 12 events in the lives of two of perhaps the most famous kings in the Bible, King Saul and King David, specifically looking at choices, character, and how people change for good or for bad. And we think it's important in this season because we not only want to have a vision for the world and for mission that's happening out there, but also a vision for our own souls. God cares about the choices that we make, and we want to hold both of these together, a a vision for cities and a vision for our own souls in this season. We begun it a few weeks ago. Today we come to the story of David and Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 31 through 52 and we're going to pray and we're going to ask God specifically to speak to us today about courage. 1 Samuel 17 verse 31. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard, that's awesome, and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with armor. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not tested them. And so David took them off. He took his stick in his hand. And he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Then the Philistine came on and approached David with a shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistines looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This gets good. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head from you and I will give the dead bodies of the armies of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all his assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. (laughs) Oh, yes. Then it happened that when the Philistines rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Friends, this is God's word. Amen? (laughs) Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, give us courage. We humbly and honestly confess that there are so many things that we fear. So many ways in which we easily cower from the call that you have on our lives. From what you are calling us to do. We allow fear to grip us and to control us. Or we simply esteem lesser things above you. 
Lord, would you turn us away from trusting in that which cannot truly give us courage. And may we look to you today, Lord. May we find rest and comfort and encouragement for our weary souls. And if there's anyone here today who does not yet know you, I pray that they would come to know you today. And for those of us that have forgotten about your great power and your might and your strength that you give, remind us. We ask this in Jesus' name. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Well, he admitted to being scared to death and paralyzed by fear the night that he got the phone call. The voice on the other end of the phone threatened to take his life and destroy his home. And after he hung up the phone, he sat down in the darkness of his kitchen, poured some coffee, and planned all the ways that he could leave Montgomery, Alabama without looking like a coward. He couldn't take it any longer. I was weak, he said. But it was there on his kitchen table that he confessed his fear to God And in that moment, heard a second voice. Stand for truth, it said. Stand for justice. I will be with you even to the end of the world. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. That night, he said, he heard the voice of God. That night, Martin Luther King Jr. found courage. There's a statement about courage. It's been attributed to many different authors. It goes like this. Courage is not the absence of fear but rather the judgment that something else is more important than your fear. And that's what we want to talk about today, friends. Listen, right now, there are many voices, like there were the night that Martin Luther King Jr. was sitting at his kitchen table. There are many voices speaking into our lives right now. There's the voice of pressure to perform, a voice calling you to be a slave to the opinions of other people. It might be today that there is the voice of your past weighing you down and burdening you. Or maybe the voice of your peers calling you to compare yourselves to other people, your life circumstance, your abilities, or perhaps the voice of your enemies seeking to demoralize you. And then there is the voice of Satan who would love nothing more than to keep you down and to keep you away from following God. There are many voices speaking into our lives, and in the midst of all of them, there is the voice of Jesus Christ, and he is calling you to follow him. He's calling you to pick up your cross. He's calling you to follow after him. Yes, there will be hardships. Yes, there will be opposition. There will be difficulties. It will be counterculture, but Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Walk in this. And friends, the question I have for you this morning is which voice has gripped your heart? Which voice are you heeding? Which voice are you listening to now? Because whichever voice you're listening to will determine how you move forward. It will determine how you make choices this week and next month. Whatever voice has gripped your heart, it's going to shape how you live, whether you will move forward in fear or whether you will move forward in faith. We need courage. Now, it's quite ironic that I'm speaking on courage because naturally, I am not a courageous person. I fear like everything. I get so easily scared. I mean, we moved a block from the beach, which for some of you is paradise. I'm scared of the water. I just said it. Some of you are like, yeah, I just, you know, childhood fears, whatever, you know, all that whole thing. So I'm like, kids, be safe. You know, I put them in all these like inner tubes and stuff so they float no matter what. I'm just, I get so easily scared. But today, in in my own natural person, I'm not a brave person, but today we're not talking about natural courage. Today, we are talking about supernatural courage. And that's what's changed everything in my life and will change everything in your life. And 1 Samuel chapter 17 is perhaps one of the most memorable stories about courage. But it's so familiar that we must be careful not to miss its meaning. See, so much of the story of Israel's kings is about learning to look beyond appearance, which is a very vital lesson in learning about and finding courage, one that even the prophet Samuel himself had to learn. See, Israel's first king, Saul, we've learned over the last few weeks, had rejected God and as a result, was rejected from being Israel's king. 
And so the prophet Samuel, who was basically the leader in Israel at that time, he was sent out by God to find a new king. And he goes to the family of Jesse. Now Jesse has all these sons, and they're all really strong and good looking. And Samuel sees the oldest son, Eliab, and says, oh, this guy must be the king. Look at him. He's, he's really strong. He's super tall. This guy's got to be the king. But God speaks to Samuel in that moment, says he's not. You need to keep looking. And Samuel goes through all the brothers until finally they say, oh, well, yeah, we have one more brother. He's out watching the sheep. But Samuel says, bring him to me. And that younger brother was named David. And it was there that God spoke to Samuel these words, a lesson that you and I need to hear. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. See, the Bible reveals that we often have wrong assumptions about power. And as a result, then, we have wrong assumptions about where we're supposed to find courage. So the question we need to ask about this text is, where are we in this story? When you read about David and Goliath and all the other characters in this story, who do you identify with? Do we identify with David or Saul or the Philistines? Where are we in the story? What's the takeaway from the story of David and Goliath? Is this just an inspirational tale for the small business facing corporate America? Like, you can do it. Or the underdog athletic team who's going to make a grand comeback against the favored opponents. Like, is that the takeaway that we're supposed to get from the David and Goliath story? See, many people, even Christians, have taught this story just as an inspirational, moralistic tale. David fought his giant, so you can go out and fight your own giant. Is that the meaning? See, we know the story, but we need to understand it. I want you to notice straight away, very little attention is given to the battle itself. I mean, the action is is over almost as quickly as it begins. What takes up so much time, the attention is given to what people are saying about the battle. They're talking to each other. Everyone has something to say. Everyone is gripped by something. Everyone in this chapter is preaching a sermon. Everyone's preaching. They all believe something and understanding this will teach us three things. Why we need courage, what keeps us from courage, and where we can get courage. So first of all, why do we need courage? 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem is a chasm which 3,000 years ago separated two armies in deadlock. It was on either side of the Valley of Elah that the army of Israel encamped and the army of the Philistines encamped. See, as we've learned over the last few weeks, Israel at this time was under threat of becoming slaves to the oppressive Philistines. And the embodiment of this threat was a man over nine feet tall carrying armor, which weight was the equivalent to a grown man. See, this deadlock between these two armies, it was going to be settled by one battle. A one-on-one battle. Each side would choose a champion, and these champions would go out to fight, and whoever won that one-on-one battle would win a victory for their people, and whoever lost would bring about defeat on their people. So when it came time for the Philistines to choose, who do you choose? The nine-foot-tall guy. Like, of course, yes, let's have Goliath. Let's have him go out and represent us. But who would represent Israel? You'd like to think, That in reading a story in the Old Testament about Israel, about the people of God, that faced with threat, that they would be the first ones saying, we're going to trust God and we're going to do this. But when you read the story, everyone's a mess. Just like you and I often are. We're like, yay, we believe God. One thing happens, like overdraft charge in your bank account. We're like, where's God? (laughs) Where is he? I don't know. We just so easily become a mess. So before you just judge everyone in Israel... Just look in the mirror for a moment. Everyone's a mess. They don't know what to do. The existence of God's people was at stake. This was national insecurity. The presence of a great enemy reveals a contrast between Saul and David. One of the great central themes of this book. And the Philistines represent a much larger biblical theme. Threats against God's people and God's purposes. What Goliath and the Philistines represent 
all throughout the Bible is there, there's this constant threat against God's people and against God's purposes. Sin threatens to take us down. Death wants to keep us there. Satan wants us enslaved. Lies threaten to keep us away from God and away from his purposes. Friends, there are real threats which can result in real fears. That's what we face day in, day out, and the battle is played out in our daily lives. You might be hearing all these voices even right now, lies saying, well, God doesn't love you. Are you really accepted by grace? Should you really obey the voice of the Lord? Shouldn't you just look out for yourself? Should you really reach out and serve your community? Should you really listen to the power of, or to the leading of the Holy Spirit? Should you do that? See, there's all these voices speaking And there's always this temptation to give up or to give in, to compromise, to say, well, I'm not really going to follow God in this matter, or I'm just going to give up there, or that seems too risky, I'm not going to do it. See, whenever there's someone or something that has power to take away what we think gives us security, we get scared. We'll all be faithful until it gets risky, right? Everybody likes the idea of being faithful, Right? Who have you ever met that said, my goal in life is to be a totally unfaithful person? <laughs> now, there are unfaithful people, but rarely does anyone actually endeavor to be an unfaithful person. We like the idea of faithfulness. We like the idea of having a faithful friend, a faithful spouse, a faithful community. We all like the idea of being faithful until it gets risky, until it actually costs you something, until there is a threat. And my dear friends, it is in that moment that you need courage. It's easy to follow when things are going well. But when it's difficult, when there are real threats, we need courage. Courage is the willingness to act on conviction in the face of fear, even when it costs. It might cost you social acceptance, or it might cost you even money. But what we need in all that is courage. Courage is not just a virtue, but it's actually a hinge upon which all the other virtues turn. C.S. Lewis puts it like this in his book, The Screwtape Letters. He said, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point, which means at the point of highest reality. A chastity or an honesty or a mercy which yields to danger will only be chaste or honest or merciful only on conditions. After all, Pontius Pilate was merciful until it became risky. Until it became risky. And some of us might be in a place where, yeah, I'm going to follow Christ. Yes, I'm going to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I'm going to do what is right. Well, until it becomes risky. But courage is, means to act rightly in the face of a threat and not be derailed from your purpose. So we must ask, what is our purpose? What is most important to us? What has gripped our hearts? See, the nation of Israel, they forgot their primary purpose, that they were to be governed by and to reflect the God who created them. That was their purpose. But they were more gripped by fear. They were more gripped by the power of their enemies than by the power of their God. And as a result, they're just a mess, and they're scrambling, and they're looking around, wondering what to do. They're scared, and on the scene comes David. This is not the first time in the book that we're introduced to this person, David. The backstory about David was told in previous chapters. Though he was the last choice, according to man's standard, he was God's choice. And on that day when Samuel saw him when he was visiting the family of Jesse, when the Holy Spirit of God spoke to Samuel and said, this man will be the king of Israel, Samuel anointed David. But it took place in secret. And it was there on that day that the Spirit of God came upon and rushed upon this young David, who at that time was just a young shepherd and a poet, who one day would become famous throughout all of history. His work would be read by millions from the book of Psalms. But in his younger years, his concern was for God. Do you notice that in verses 31 and 32? What's David's concern? Everyone else is just a mess. What's David's concern? David's concern is that the people had forgotten their God. See, this story that takes place in this valley is not just about who has advantages, who has disadvantages. It's about what you esteem the most. This story is about what you worship. Because what you worship will determine what you fear and where you get courage. And that's why, secondly, we need to talk about what keeps us from courage. 
So yes, there are real threats. We have a real enemy. There are real obstacles. And there are a lot of voices speaking to our lives. And much like the competing voices that you and I hear every single day, David had his own. And these voices in the story are examples of what can keep you and I from being courageous. And the first voice we hear is the voice of cynicism. Okay, this is important. We didn't read it earlier, but David's older brother was on the scene. Now, you would think David's older brother in a moment of need might be encouraging. Like, hey, little bro, you've got this. I saw you attack the lion and the bear, and you're going to do great. Most of you are like, my older brother never did that to me. Well, (laughs) same with David. Family issues. Look at verses 28. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep? Notice detail, those few sheep in the wilderness. I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Typical little brother. What have I done now? Was it not just a question? Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered the same thing as before. See, what we see in Eliab is the voice of cynicism. Listen, cynicism destroys courage. Cynicism erodes faith. And I understand this because I feel like ever since I've become a Christian, God is constantly pulling me out of cynicism. You you know the voice of a cynic. What? You're going to pray. Nothing's really going to happen. Yeah, we'll go to church and we'll pray for these things. But, you know, we're, I mean, really, we're going to pray for these new endeavors in the coastlands. But, I mean, is anything really going to happen? Are you really going to see a miracle? I've been praying this for years. And, you know, yeah, sure, do the right thing. But what good is it going to do? That is the voice of a cynic. See, here's the thing about cynics. Cynics claim to see everything clearly. Oh, I see through that. I see how it's all going to happen. Yeah, I'll go along with your little thing. We'll try to ask God for great things, but no great things will happen because no great things ever happen. And then we'll get here, and then what are you going to do? See, cynics, they speak so authoritatively like, oh, I see how this is all going to end. If you're, and some of you know that voice. Some of you know that voice well. And some of you today, you are that voice. You're the voice of a cynic, maybe even in this church. Yeah, these new endeavors, new mission, whatever. No, not whatever. Listen, I'm going to preach for a minute here. Is that okay? Can I do that in this church? And I preach to myself because I know, especially being born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which breeds cynics, I understand this. I need this. Listen, if you're a cynic, then you claim to see everything. Like, you've got it figured out, and the Word of God says to you, really? Do you actually know everything? Do you really know everything? Do you know the alpha from the omega? Do you know the beginning from the end? Were you there when God created the world? No, I don't think you were, actually. (laughs) Were you there when God did the miraculous in time past? Were you the one that created animals? Nope, you weren't there, were you? Were you there when I brought you forth in your mother's womb and you came into this world? Did you give yourself your own life? No, you weren't there. So just for a moment, humble yourself before the word of God, die to your cynicism, and lift up the name of Christ. That needs to happen in our lives, that needs to happen in our church, and some of you who are married are like elbowing your husband and your wife, like, we're going to have a good lunch today after church. (laughs) See, some of us, we're so familiar with this, like, what are you doing here, and what is this happening? It needs to stop. Cynicism will destroy courage, but there's also the voice of despair, and we find that in the voice of King Saul. Think about what's going on here. King Saul is the one that should be fighting. King Saul is the one who should have said, when they were looking for a champion, King Saul should have said, I will go. But instead, he's sitting in his tent like, who's going to go? And everyone, the soldiers are like, maybe the king? Oh, maybe not. Oh, he's kind of (laughs) sad. Saul's the king of Israel. He's the one that should be fighting. And yet we know now that because he had been He'd rejected God. God had rejected him as king. The Holy Spirit, who had once come upon him, had departed from him. And he is now, like everyone else, he's so gripped by Goliath. He's so gripped by this Philistine champion that his heart is gripped by fear. He's so impressed with the size and the armor of the Philistines that he's depressed that he doesn't have it. In one sense, 
both Saul and Goliath are trusting in the same thing. On the one side, you have Goliath. He's like, I'm nine feet tall, and I've got all this armor. And Saul's like, he's got the armor. He's nine feet tall. Saul and Goliath are trusting in the same thing. And in both cases, God is completely irrelevant. And isn't that just the case for us at times? We're just gripped by fear, and somebody mentions God, and you're like, yeah, God, well, whatever. You know, it's just so over there. But here's my problem. I've got an overdraft chart. What am I going to do about it? <laughs> God's not concerned with that. In both cases, God seems irrelevant, and oftentimes it is the case in our own life. But I want you to notice for a moment, and this is an important lesson, some of the greatest discouragements will not only come from those against you, but those right beside you. Have you noticed, have you noticed that the cynicism and despair is coming from the people who should be on the side of David? There's his older brother, like, hey, will my older brother give me encouragement? No. Older brother's like, insolence and wickedness. And then there's Saul, so like, well, what are we going to do? And David's like, what in the world? Listen, we... sometimes, sometimes, the greatest discouragement that you will experience will come from other people in the church. Can we talk about this? <laughs> it happens. It happens. And, and I want to make this point very clear for two reasons. One, expect that that may be the case. Don't let it derail you when it happens. I remember being a new Christian, and I was in that phase where I'm like, oh my gosh, like everything's amazing. And I had this one person that's like a cynic, like, well, is God always amazing? And I'm like, wait, are you a Christian? Can a Christian say that? And, and I was a little, I was caught off guard. Because I didn't realize that the discouraging voice in my life would actually be a, a fellow Christian. But it happens. So I say that to inform you, first of all, expect that that might be the case. But secondly, do not let it discourage you. And do not allow that voice to make you bitter. It would be so easy to be David and be like, my older brother, my father's not there. King Saul, the king, like he didn't come through for me. And my older brother didn't come through for me. And let's be honest, so many of us, we operate out of woundedness. Like, oh, these people are discouraging, those people are discouraging, so I'm not going to do anything. But David doesn't do that. And neither should you, and neither should I. Do not let this make you become bitter. Because dealing with discouraging words is part of your own growth. It's part of your own growth. God actually uses it to prepare you. Sometimes your friends and even other people in the church might speak a discouraging word. That is an opportunity for you to trust in God's word. Spurgeon was very honest about this. Love Spurgeon. He said, many a man meets with more trouble from his friends than his enemies. And when he, has over, when he has learned to overcome the depressing influence of prudent friends, he makes short work of the opposition of real adversaries. Thank you, Mr. Spurgeon. <laughs> but see, David seems almost immune to it. Why? Because David was already living in a pattern where he was offering up his life and his abilities to God, and he was able to watch God use them, watch God guide them. When David was trying on Saul's armor, it didn't fit in verses 38 through 40, and that was okay. David said, I don't need your armor because I've been watching God use my sling. I've been watching God use the skills that he's given me as a shepherd in protecting the flock. It wasn't wrong that David didn't wear Saul's armor. It just didn't fit. And the point I want you to see here, friends, with David is this. Courage that he had on the battlefield was courage that was previously cultivated in the, in the wilderness. It was when nobody else was looking. The courage that he had in public was courage cultivated in private. It was there when nobody else was looking that he learned that God's voice was the most important voice. I don't think any of us love going into a wilderness season. Like, I, I've never met a Christian who said, yes, Lord, take me into the wilderness season where nobody's around and nobody's encouraging me and, like, nobody's there. Like, I've, I've never heard a Christian say that. And yet, it is very often in the wilderness that we learn to hear God's voice the most. We learn that God's voice is the most important voice. And we need to know this because there's another voice in this battle, and it's the voice of arrogance. It's the voice of Goliath. What's Goliath doing in this battle? He's seeking to intimidate. He's seeking to demoralize. He's seeking to do the very things that Satan himself will do to you. 
See, in this sense, Goliath is in some ways a representative of Satan, of the devil, who will come in and seek to, to lie to you, discourage you, and he'll do one of two things. He'll either try to puff yourself up by saying, oh, you're amazing. You're so amazing, you don't even really need God. And you're like, I am kind of amazing. I mean, that's what the culture's always telling me. Like, I'm amazing. I don't really need God. See, Goliath and the Philistines are like, look at what we have. Look at our armor. Look at our champion. Friends, that is the wisdom of the world. Saying, look to your own strength. Look to yourself. You've got this. You know, you don't need God. You've got this on your own. You can do it on your own. And everybody hears that in our culture. Like, yeah, pump your fist in the air. Like, I've got this. I can crush it. It's a counterfeit courage. That's what we see in Goliath. It is a counterfeit courage. And if Satan can't win in trying to puff you up, he'll beat you up. He'll just say, you're not the beloved of God. Where did you read that? I mean, you sinned last week. You don't belong in the family of God. I mean, does, does God really love you? Is he really going to provide for you? I mean, has God really answered your prayers? Friends, the voice of Satan wants to rule your life. The voice of Satan wants to keep you back from obeying God and trusting in your own strength. And that's exactly what Goliath was doing, and it is the voice of arrogance, and we are not to listen, for Goliath was foolish in looking to himself. He was so confident in his own strength that apparently he didn't see the leather straps on David's sling. He was so blind. And friends, now the stage is set. God in this story would give a great victory through what everybody else considered as a weakness. Who's this, this boy, this shepherd? Like, what, what's he going to do? And yet it was through him that God would bring a victory. And so we begin to see the ways in which David's role will anticipate the role of Jesus Christ. In fact, you need to study the life of David in order to learn more about the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, when Jesus is first introduced to the world in the Gospels, he is introduced as what? The son of David. David's life is an indispensable background for understanding what the life of Jesus means for us. That's why so much time and space in the Bible is given to the life of, of Jesus. When David is at his worst, we'll see our need for Jesus. When David is at his best, we'll see an anticipation of Jesus. And there's striking similarities between the two. Both David and Jesus were born in Bethlehem. Both David and Jesus were rejected by their brothers. Both David and Jesus were anointed as king before their reign was fully consummated. And so, in anticipation of Jesus... And in contrast to Saul, David steps out to face the giant. And we begin to see the ways in which David will rise as king, showing us, thirdly, where we find courage. You might think, what does this story have to do with me? Like, what is this ancient story? Okay, David, he's anointed as king. There's this giant. Like, what in the world? Where do we find courage from this? Friends, the clue is found in David's speech. David picks up some stones, he runs towards the enemy, and as he does, he preaches a sermon. Don't you love that? I just picture him like slinging, and he's like, first of all, point number one, God is living. Secondly, he is victorious, just in full swing. David is preaching a sermon. He's declaring truth as he's going forward, and he's not only declaring truth, he's acting on it. He says, the living God. Did you notice that? He said, the living God, the living God. There is a pattern I want you to notice in all of David's commands. When he says to the giant, like, you're going to die. The birds and the beasts are going to eat on your body. So graphic. You're like, oh, yeah, welcome to the Bible. It's there. As David is just preaching this sermon and he's giving all these commands, like, I'm going to fight against you. All of his imperatives are based on indicatives. In other words, everything that he's saying is going to happen is based on something that is already true. David is saying, because God is, therefore I will do. And friends, that is how we are to live our lives. We are to move forward knowing what is already true about God so that we can act on it. God is alive. God is victorious. And therefore, I can move forward. David was able to face the giant without Saul's armor because he had an armor on the inside. He had an armor over his heart, and that was the truth of God. But that is not all there is to the story. 
we don't just stop there. See, some people, they stop there and they think, okay, great story. David's awesome. If I could just have a faith like David, then nothing bad will happen. I've heard that taught a lot in churches. If I could just have a faith like David, and we make these big posters of David, which is fine if we do that, but David's not our savior, is he? We just think, if, if I could just be more like David, nothing bad will happen. And so here, here's how it goes down in the Christian life, for, if we believe that way. We say, man, today, it's Sunday. I'm going to be like David. I'm going to totally be like David today. And then something bad happens, and we're like, dang it. I wasn't David enough. <laughs> and our friends, we come around like, man, you just need to be a little more David-like. Yeah, God, I just got to get my David together. And, but listen. David in this story never says, hey guys, come on, I'm going to kill the giant so you can kill your own giant. He doesn't say that. In fact, to use the phrase of another commentator on this story, David here is not so much an example, he's a representative. This story is really unique. See, he is the one, the chosen one, that God anointed as king to step out of the army to represent his people. And whatever happens to him will determine the fate of the rest of the people. See, many men and women read the story and we try to find ourselves in David, but we forget the unique role that he had in Israel. He was chosen and anointed by God to be his king. What was a king supposed to do? What did God especially empower a king for? It was to serve and to save the people. God had called him for this very purpose. And so it was because of what God declared that it was through David's apparent weakness that David would win a victory on behalf of his people who were afraid on the sidelines as a representative. What we are reading about here is a saving event in which God chose a mediator who wins the victory while all the rest of the people stand by on the sidelines and yet get to share in it. See, this story is so unique and it's connected to something so very important about how you and I find courage. See, it's not merely just an example, go out there and be like David. And David makes this clear in his own speech. Look at verses 46 and 47. David is so clear. Whose battle is it? Is it Goliath's battle? No. Is it David's battle? No, he doesn't say that. Whose battle is it? It's the Lord's battle. And so, church, we not merely need the example of David, we need the God of David. That is what gives us courage. We go forth saying, I believe in David's God. He is a living God. He is a mighty God. He is a victorious God. And the God of David gives us a victory through the son of David, who is Jesus Christ. For Jesus, who at the point seemed to suffer a total defeat, 2,000 years ago when Jesus went to the cross and everyone had forsaken him and it looked like weakness. When Jesus went to the cross, it looked like everything was done for. It looked like everyone's hopes that were in Jesus just died. It looked on that day, Good Friday, it looked like Satan won and Jesus lost. But a few days later, we get to Easter Sunday. And Jesus was not dead. The tomb was open. Jesus is alive. We don't believe in a dead Savior, but a risen Savior who is alive. There is a human heartbeat at the right hand of the throne of God right now interceding for you. And his name is King Jesus. And he is the one that brings us into the victory. The true shepherd who through his own apparent weakness brought about a victory that we could never win for ourselves. Listen, a courage that we need is not found in what can be won by us It's a courage that must be found in a battle that's been won for us. A new kind of courage only comes from a new kind of David. And his name is Jesus. So where are we in the story? We're on the sidelines. We're all like the people of Israel, like, what's going to happen? And we look at the giant that is sin, Satan, demons, death, despair. We're on the sidelines. Which of us is going to stand forward and say, oh, I could defeat Satan? Which one of us is going to say, oh, I can defeat death? Which one of us is going to step out and say, oh, I can totally take care of sin? None of us could ever do that. But in that moment where we would normally be left in our sin and despair, guess who shows up? Jesus Christ, and he slays the giant that none of us could ever slay ourselves. And friends, this is not some new idea or new interpretation of the story of David and Goliath. Listen to what Martin Luther wrote hundreds of years ago. Take it in. When David overcame the great Goliath, there came among the Jewish people a good report 
and encouraging news that their terrible enemy had been struck down and that they had been rescued and given joy and peace and they sang and they danced and they were glad for it. Thus, this gospel of God or New Testament is a good story. And a good report sounded forth into all the world by the apostles telling of a true David who strove with sin, death, and the devil and overcame them and thereby rescued all who were in captive in sin, afflicted with death and overpowered by the devil. Jesus Christ is the hero of the story. And through his life, death, and resurrection, all the preparation we need to walk in victory has already been provided for us. So how do we find courage? Brothers and sisters, here's what you do. Take everything you fear right now and measure it according to the greatness of Jesus. Take everything that you fear right now. Maybe it's the opinions of people. Maybe that's gripped your heart. Take the opinions of people and measure them according to the greatness of Jesus' opinion of you. Who wins? Sunday school answer? Jesus. Good job. (laughs) Take all that you fear in this life. You don't have enough money in the bank. Take your fear of debt or whatever that is and measure it according to the riches of Jesus Christ, who is your provider and your protector. Maybe you fear enemies. Maybe you have real people that are out to get you. That may be true. Compare that to the enemy that you could never defeat, Satan himself, and compare that to the victor, Jesus Christ, who defeated Satan on the cross. Measure what you fear against the greatness of Jesus. Who wins? It is Jesus again and again and again. Church, I am convinced that what we need now is a higher opinion of God. That is what is so often lacking when we talk about, you know, even God doing great things in the coastland. And I believe that right now you guys are entering into a season where God just wants to do a new, fresh work of the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's going to use you. And that might bring a little fear like, wait, is it really going to happen? Or can I really do that? What you need now and what I need now as my family and I take these steps of faith just like you are taking your own steps of faith is a higher view of Jesus. We need a higher view of God. So what the Holy Spirit is stirring up in us. We need to look at the greatness of God. Because if what he has done is true, if what he's done for us in Jesus Christ is true, then we can be rescued from our own cowardness. See, in this story, one side is impressed with height and might. The other side is impressed with God. And I want us to be a community of men and women who are impressed with God. True courage is not about minimizing your fears. See, some people think that's what courage is. Like, nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. Nothing bad's going to happen. I'm not losing my house. There's no foreclosure happening. Like, some people think courage is about minimizing your fears. It's not. True courage is not about minimizing your fears, but comparing them to a greater hope. And there's no greater hope than Jesus. Saying, yes, these things are true, but Jesus Christ is greater. And we find great courage by following our great king. So I want to leave you with this. Through the victory of King Jesus, who won this ultimate battle for us, what what do we take away from this? There are a million applications. Let me just give you four. Let me just spare you the million. You can learn about them later. Let me just give you four right now. Through the victory of Jesus, you are empowered by the Spirit. Just as David, because of God's grace, was empowered by the Spirit, we who believe through Jesus Christ, we are given God's Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who applies the great victory of Jesus Christ to our own lives. I mean, when we think about the mission that God's put before us, to share the gospel with other people, to reach out, maybe to to seek out that friend that you need to be reconciled with, or that conversation that you are dreading, or that decision of integrity you know that you need to make, and there's all this fear in your heart. Remember, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, you're not left alone. God himself has made his home in you. And it's because you have the spirit that you can move forward with great courage, sharing this good news of Jesus Christ, this good news of redemption. And as you do, men and women in the coastlands will encounter the presence of the living God. Isn't that an incredible truth? Because we have the Holy Spirit, we become God's ambassadors. We become God's representatives so that other people can encounter the living God. That is what I desire. I desire that for myself. I desire that for others, that we would encounter God. And the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us for the daily battles that take place both outside and within us. 
Even the battles that you feel are raging with Satan himself and all the lies and all the things that he's roaring against you, listen. The book of James says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will flee from you because Satan trembles at a praying Christian. The devil will flee from you. Walk in the spirit and you will destroy the works of the devil. Walk in the spirit and you will destroy the works of the flesh. Through the victory of King Jesus, you are empowered by the Spirit. Secondly, you are given new desires. Have you noticed what David is just all about in this passage? He's all about God. He's all about God's name. He's all about God's honor. He's all about God's reputation. He's all about God's integrity. It's just God, God, God. David is just focused on God. And it's, friends, through the victory of Jesus that we're given these new desires where you and I actually care about what God cares about. Because so often we just care so much about lesser things. Like, imagine if David was like, well, how am I going to look in front of people? Like, that wouldn't be a great story. And David thought a lot of the opinions of others that day. Like, that's not the great story. It's that he's marching out there preaching a sermon about God. See, through the victory of Jesus, you go after God's heart, not against God's heart. He's the one that turns us, and maybe today we need to be turned away. We need to repent of our cynicism. We need to repent of our despair. We need to repent of our arrogance and turn away from that and say, God, I want to be more concerned for your glory than my own reputation. Honest question, what would you do today? What choice would you make today if you were more concerned with Christ's glory than your own reputation? Where would you step out in faith? What conversation would you have if you were more concerned with God's glory than your own reputation? See, David here is saying, God, your reputation matters. Your people matter, and that's worth the risk. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he said it even greater. God's holiness and our eternity was at stake. And Jesus said, I'm not just going to risk my life. I'm going to give my life on the cross for these men and women. Which leads to the third through the victory of King Jesus, you are willing to stand alone. It is great to know, friends, that there are other people around you. I mean, you're in a room right now of hundreds. It is so great to know what a blessing it is to be able to know other Christians. Have you ever thought about that for a moment? We tend to take for granted the fact that we even know Christians. We're like, ah, oh, they're kind of weird. They're kind of lame. I didn't like their prayer. They should have eaten gum before they prayed for me, but I'll forgive them. Like, we just, we, we get so familiar with this. But have you ever just stopped and got on your knees and thanked God from the bottom of your heart that you even know a Christian? Oh, maybe just glory in that. It is so wonderful. But there are and will be times and seasons where you will stand alone. David had to learn what it meant to be alone before God in the wilderness. And we must learn the same in those secret hours when nobody else is watching. And here's why this is so important, friends, because if you're only willing to follow Jesus in a crowd, then you're following the crowd, not Jesus. If you're just like, hey, I'm into Jesus, because look, everybody else here seems to be into Jesus. This is great. But then you're just following the crowd. What will happen when the crowd dissipates? What will happen when the people begin to fall away? Will you still stand? But see, this is what the Holy Spirit gives you. This is what the victory of Jesus gives you. Courage to stand alone. And at times, yes, it will be hard. Paul the Apostle in the New Testament, he knew what it was like to stand alone. In fact, he knew what it was like to be abandoned by his own friends. If you've ever read Paul's second letter to Timothy, it's like his final letter. It's like his last will and testament. And he's writing to young Pastor Timothy. He knows his time is short. He knows he's about to die. And he's writing this very personal, very honest letter to Timothy. And in there, he acknowledges that he had been abandoned by other people. Listen to what Paul says. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. Stop right there. Many of us are really good at writing that sentence. Everyone's deserted me. Everyone's abandoned me. No one came by my side. And usually from there, we, we, we get into bitterness, and, and we just get frustrated with other people, like, oh, nobody was there for me, like, I'm done with church, I'm done with these people. We might even, if we were Paul, if I was Paul writing that letter to 2 Timothy, I would, by name and by action, list everyone who's ever abandoned me. I'm like, Timothy, I want you to know before I die, there was Robert, total jerk, <laughs> never called me back. Never replied to my text. Then there's Susie. Oh, Susie. Let's not even talk about Susie. Never even replied to my email. 
And then there's Jimmy, and, and I want you to read this whole letter to the whole church. See, we would love to justify ourselves and say, oh, look at all these people that abandoned me. But look at what Paul says. May it not be charged against them. What? That's usually not how we respond, but that's how Paul responds. And you might say, well, how do I get there? By the next sentence. But the Lord stood by me. The Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. It is when this vision of the victory of Jesus Christ has captured your heart that you can say, even in the most difficult of times, the Lord stood with me. The Lord stood with me. Church, you never need to fear ultimate abandonment, the failures of others, or even the opposition of your greatest enemy. For when God stands with you, you never stand alone. He is always with you. And knowing that you belong to God is the beginning of your courage, which leads to my last point. Through the victory of Jesus Christ, you are more than conquerors. You are more than conquerors. Paul says that in Romans 8. You're more than conquerors. Why? Because Jesus Christ, because he's victorious, is even working all the bad things in your life together for good. Somehow, someway, he's weaving everything together, even the difficult trials. And if you doubt that, look to the cross. What on Good Friday seemed like the worst thing ever on Easter Sunday was the best news you could tell. God, right now, is weaving everything together for good. And because of Christ's victory, you are more than a conqueror. And this is to be the armor over your heart. So how do we respond today? What is the first thing we should do? What's the application I want you to take away with? It's this, rejoice. What was the first thing the soldiers did? Did they go out there and try to kill Goliath? No, Goliath was dead. What did the soldiers do? They partied. They're like, yay, our enemy has been defeated. This is the first thing that the soldiers did, and it's the first thing that you and I should do in hearing about the victory of Jesus Christ. Christ has conquered the worst, and so has enabled us to face everything else. Let this fill your mind and fire up your imagination that Jesus is victorious, and he's the one that causes you to sing. That story about Martin Luther King Jr. getting that phone call that night, well, it turns out that night that he was informed that his house was bombed. And when he showed up to his property, all these people were there, and they were ready like a mob. They were ready to do battle. What did he do? He sang Amazing Grace. He led everybody in singing Amazing Grace. What in the world? How can you do that? Why? And why could we sing Amazing Grace even in the worst of circumstances? Here's why. Because the one battle that could have truly wiped you out has already been won in Jesus Christ. Amen? That is good news. Jesus is victorious, and Christ gives us the courage we need because he's working all these things together for good. True courage is not the absence of fear, but the presence of Jesus Christ. We're all scattered on the sidelines, but we discover courage as we look to the great victory of our King Jesus, and we listen to his voice. And so today, church, I want you to take steps in that victory. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, today is the day. Say, Jesus, I trust you. Accept me not on the basis of what I've done, but on the basis of what you have done. Take that step today. If you need prayer for anything, I want you to come up and ask for prayer. It takes courage to come up and say, I'm in need. But let's just get over it. All of us in this room are in need. That's why we lift our hands in worship. You ever notice that? You're like, I don't like to do it. It makes me feel vulnerable and weak. Guess what? You are vulnerable and weak. And we need the power of God. So all of us in here should be like, God, we need you. But we don't need to do it with fear, but with joy because Christ is victorious and we proclaim this. And as you come up and take communion, I want you to take the bread, dip it in the cup and say, Jesus is one. Satan is a defeated foe. My sin has been taken care of. And so we can confess and repent freely because of Christ's victory. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's, let's give God another. And let's enter into that worship right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the victory that is in Jesus Christ and that our response today is that of rejoicing. Thank you that you have conquered all of our greatest fears and you will always be faithful to us even when we are unfaithful. So God, may we rejoice in that today. May we take courage. May we not listen to all the other voices seeking to keep us back from obedience seeking to keep us back from your will and your blessings. Jesus Christ, may your voice trump all others. And even in this time, God, may we just experience the joy and freedom of worship. 
that we would just declare, just Jesus, you are worthy of my worship. You're worthy of my worship, and you have conquered our greatest foe. May we rejoice today. May we receive prayer and faith, communion and faith, and worship and faith. We ask today in Jesus' name, amen.